Now at five, new information about the Boone County crash that claimed three lives. What the driver said was happening just before the crash. A man had $5,000 withdrawn from his account, but he says it wasn't him. I'm Steffi Wade looking into how this could have happened and trying to get his money back. I mean, we're not against the facility. We're just against the location. Residents banding together to oppose a rehab facility in their neighborhood. We are digging into the location selection process. This is RTV6 News at 5, working for you. Now at 5, new information tonight about the deadly I-65 crash in Boone County that killed three people, including a child. And the truck driver giving police details about what he said happened near the Zionsville exit on Sunday. We go straight to Cornelius Hawker, who's at the live desk with what he just learned about how this wreck happened. Cornelius. Yeah, Amanda, that massive wreck involving a semi-truck and eight other cars shut down I-65 near the Zionsville exit for several hours on Sunday. And this probable cause affidavit shows why Matthew Small has been charged with three counts of reckless homicide. It started Sunday morning just after 11 when 911 calls started pouring into the Boone County Communications Center about a terrible accident on I-65 involving a semi-truck hitting several cars on the road. Officers arriving to that crash found a horrific scene of cars strewn about the interstate and a semi-truck pinning a car up against the guardrail. Both the semi and car burst into flames right after officers arrived. The three people in the car, Haley Kirk, Mariah Tomey, and Hadley Tomey, all died. Matthew Small admitted to the Boone County Sheriff's Office that right before the wreck, he was talking on the phone through a headset to his wife when he picked up his coffee to grab a drink. Whenever he put the coffee down, he said he noticed traffic was stopped, so he dropped his cup and grabbed the steering wheel with both hands, but it was too late. He told the sheriff's office he doesn't remember hitting all the cars, but remembers thinking he needed to get over into the emergency shoulder area. He then remembers people beating on his door, telling him to get out of the truck. He's now in the Boone County Jail, waiting on his court date. Now, reckless homicide is a level five felony, so if he is convicted on all those charges, he could face a maximum of 18 years in prison. And just yesterday, Small expressed sorrow for the wreck in a handwritten note saying he was in agony over the whole ordeal. Mark? Well, Cornelius Hawker at the live desk for us tonight. Hey, the Iowa trucking company involved in the crash, VL Trucking, issued a statement today to RTV6. It says, quote, our deepest thoughts and prayers go out to all of those affected by this tragic crash. This isolated incident is certainly not reflective of the quality, dedication, and responsibility that our drivers nationwide commit to every day, end quote. The dispatch operations manager said the company is fully cooperating in the investigation. The company is headquartered in Dubuque, Iowa, and has 100 20 drivers. $5,000 taken right out of a bank account. That's what one local man says happened to him. After trying to get to the bottom of what happened for over a week, he reached out to RTV6 for help. Our Stephanie Wade is working for you tonight to hold the bank accountable. Mark Godby got an alert on his phone on December 27th that $5,000 was withdrawn from his account from this Chase Bank location in Wanamaker, Indiana. But he says that couldn't have been possible because he was sitting at home in Claremont at the time. How, how did this happen? You tell me. I don't know. While recovering on his couch from surgery in Claremont, Indiana, Mark Godby was puzzled when an alert came through his phone notifying him of his successful withdrawal of $5,000 from his personal savings account. Attached to the Chase Bank mobile app notification was a copy of the withdrawal slip. That's not your handwriting. Of course not. He says he never withdrew the money, called Chase, who told him someone took the money out under his name. Chase has yet to return the money to him or provide him with an explanation as to what went wrong. We reached out to Chase today. Their response to what happened and how they're making it right, coming up at 6. Working for you, Stephanie Wade, RTV6. Well, tonight, one of the largest health care providers in our state finds itself on the wrong side of a federal lawsuit for its alleged role in Medicare fraud. Community Health Network is accused of filing false Medicare claims from doctors who were paid bonuses in exchange for making certain number of referrals. The law, in essence, says that hospitals cannot bill Medicare for services which were referred to a patient by a doctor who is receiving improper compensation from the hospital for the referral. Federal prosecutors are taking a close look at a number of services billed, saying 
the hospital network paid the physicians involved well above fair market value. Community Health Network issued a statement following the announcement by the U.S. Attorney's Office. When it comes to doctor compensation, the company said, quote, community recognizes that physician compensation is very complex and highly regulated. Our physician compensation practices are a key part of our overall compliance efforts. We are confident that we operate in a legally compliant manner. To ensure compliance, as is standard in the industry, community uses a variety of resources, including independent, third parties, to evaluate physician compensation to ensure it is a fair as the law requires, end quote. The Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office are both handling the case. On the Storm James 6 Tracking Center with meteorologist Kevin Gregory, a beautiful day out. I love all the sunshine. Sunshine is key to a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. Dry again tomorrow. And then I think the big story is Friday and Saturday rain and excessive rainfall potentially. We're at 42 right now. This next 24 hours will be the coolest within the forecast, at least through the weekend. Temperature in Castleton and New Powell, 42. Greenfield as well in the lower 40s. Temperatures a little cooler to the north, a little warmer to the south and as we mentioned lower to middle 40s in central Indiana. You temper that with the wind a bit still west northwest anywhere from 15 to almost 20 miles per hour. The wind will relax a bit tonight and be calmer during the day tomorrow. Clouds will generally fade away. We'll see skies mostly clear as we go through the overnight. Temperatures will fall into the middle 20s between now and 10. Not much happens. Temperature fall will be uh, kind of slow. West wind 15 miles per hour. As we talk about tomorrow, we've got sunshine in the forecast, but it's the rain that headlines the forecast starting late Thursday. Some of this may be heavy by the time we get to Saturday night. Two to four inch rainfall potential. That's usually like a snow forecast, isn't it? Two to four inches of rain with isolated higher amounts. I'll take you through the timeline coming up. Tonight, Anderson residents say they are running out of time when it comes to keeping a rehabilitation facility for drug addicts and those battling mental illness from opening in their neighborhood. RTV6's Troy Washington is working for you to get to the bottom of the controversial debate over the location selection process. This is the wrong location. Madison County does need a rehab of this type. They need they need one for women as well. Um, but it's not. This is not the right location. Sean Clemens lives less than a mile away from Sunrise Church Camp. It's a very nice facility. It's you know, the Aspire, the petitioners, they refer to it as Malibu. In the summer, it's gorgeous. It's tree lined. It's beautiful. In September, she found out the former church retreat for disabled children that has been empty for three years could soon become a substance abuse recovery center. We do worry about crime, not just because of the high intensity rehab, but you're bringing 100 people, bare minimum, to our neighborhood. Right away, neighbors asked for a continuance to delay the process. Again, the same request was made in November until the city council voted six to two in December to move forward with the process of making a special exception to open. We showed up in force. Clemens says at least 100 residents from the three neighborhoods closest to Sunrise Retreat showed up to express their disapproval of the location choice. And still, city council pressed forward. They feel that this is such a gem, which it is, that they can't let go of it. RTV6 asked leaders why this location instead of anywhere else. No one would comment on the matter before the vote takes place. On Wednesday, the Board of Zoning Appeals will make the decision whether the facility gets to open or not. But regardless, residents say they're not done fighting this. We will take this further. We will not stop here. At this point, residents say they feel ignored, especially since after Wednesday, things could push forward despite their stance against it. They say this decision will impact their property value and ultimately they won't feel safe. They fear who could end up wandering in the area they consider their safe space. Thinking about what tomorrow could possibly hold makes these neighbors uneasy. If they were to vote yes, it's a turnkey operation. That means they can turn the key and it's open. Working for you in Madison County, Troy Washington, RTV6. A White House Office of National Drug Control Policy official visited the facility in December and voiced her support of opening the facility, saying it'll serve as a model that can be used throughout Indiana and other states. An Indiana House committee today rejected a Democratic proposal to direct $291 million in unexpected state tax revenue toward one-time teacher pay bonuses. The Republican-controlled House Ways and Means Committee voted 13-7 to along party lines against the proposal going along with Governor Eric Holder 
Holcomb's request that the revenue go toward play, paying cash rather than borrowing money for several planned college campus construction projects. Governor Holcomb has hinted he would address teacher pay in next Tuesday's State of the State Address. Still ahead at 530 on our TV6, vehicle safety concerns why the government has launched an investigation into a popular SUV. It's a new era at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, led now, of course, by the Penske Corporation and Roger Penske. Very special reception going on now at Bankers Life Fieldhouse. We'll hear from RP coming up. And we'll see more rain in the forecast. Again, not imminent, but as we get to the end of the week, end of the weekend, more on this coming up. Rain. Today, the state of Indiana is taking time to honor the new owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the longtime former owners who just handed over the reins. At the state house today, in the house, the legends in the auto industry. New IMS owner Roger Penske stood alongside former owner Tony George, as was Speaker Brian Bosma. The house uh, recognized the Holman George family with a resolution honoring their legacy as track owners and celebrating the incoming leadership of Roger Penske. For me and for my son and our family, we just hope that uh, we can carry on the legacy <clears throat> and certainly the stature, the iconic stature of the Speedway, the 500, and certainly what it brings to the region, to the town of Speedway, to the city and the state of, of Indiana. We want to continue to build that. The sale of the track to Penske became final yesterday after being in the Holman George family since 1945. And the state of Indiana continues the warm welcome right now at a reception honoring Roger Penske hosted by Governor Holcomb. Sports Director Dave First joins us live from the event at Baker's Life Field House. Hey Dave. Yeah, usually we're talking about Pacers and Racers in May. We're going to move that ahead to January, though. And a very special event behind me is Roger Pinsky, uh, the new owner now of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, has taken to the podium here in a very special event here at the Fieldhouse, uh, bringing Pacers and Racers together. In fact, let's show you the reception here that began about an hour or so ago here at the Fieldhouse. Really nice kickoff as Governor Eric Holpin uh, is the host, Mayor Joe Hogsett on hand, but perhaps more. More importantly, Tony George and members of the Holman George family are here as well. It's certainly with their blessing that this transfer has happened after 74 years of stewardship. Uh, Rogers Race Team, as you know, has won 18 Indy 500, 16 IndyCar titles, but all of that is pushed aside now as he follows the footsteps of Carl Fisher, Eddie Rickenbacker, and Tony Holman, and he has some ideas about how to improve the speedway. How can we keep the guest experience? Where it is, we spent many hours in meetings, guest experience, guest experience, what can we do? Right. And I would think that our commitment today is not to build something that's maybe going to give us more revenue, but what can we do? And we're going to spend several million dollars between now and race day, or the first of May, mm -hmm. to make the guest experience better. And that's my commitment. And those things we hope that we can announce 100 days out. This year, so you've got the Indy 500 Memorial. And that's a news item for sure. Several millions of dollars being spent on IMS. Again, that 100-day uh, comes up in mid-February, so we'll hear more about that. And Roger just uh, told the, the folks here at Bankers Live Fieldhouse they've already sold 75% of the tickets for the Indy 500 coming up in May. Certainly a new era, and we'll go one-on-one. -on -one more of that interview with Roger Pinsky coming up at 6 in our Sports Extra Spotlight. For now, Dave First reporting live from the Fieldhouse, RTV6 Sports. And when you think about it, May is just around the corner. It'll be here in no time. I'm just waiting for winter to show up first. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, <laughs> where is that? Let's hope yeah. it doesn't show up in May. Uh, the latest measurable snow we've ever had was in early May, back in the back of the day. May 24th is race day, mm. so put that on your calendar. Okay, is this beautiful? Look at that. All is this summer? Is it looks like beautiful? it. Yeah, the ducks think it is. A little shimmer off the water there, thanks to our Otis Jones photojournalist catching this at the canal today. Lots of open water for uh, the geese and ducks and anyone who wants to touch it as uh, ice has been a commodity so far this winter. I want to show you closest snow is off into Washington, uh, D.C., Pennsylvania to some rain along the coast. Could be a couple flurries upstream from us. Here's the story. Tomorrow, lots of sunshine, 
Temperatures in the 30s. That's our coolest day until we get to early next week. Temperatures quickly warm back to 50 or above. The wind will be strong Thursday, grabbing hold of warmer air, but also moist air. That will set the stage for rain. Some of that rain may be heavy. Not tomorrow. Rain chances slowly increase Thursday. I think Friday and Saturday, the two wettest days and the two best days for heavy rain potential. Maybe talking about some flooding issues as we get to the weekend as a result of the ground still being nearly saturated despite the fact we haven't had any recent rain in the last few days. As far as rainfall potential, this is just one forecast model and these are going to bounce around where will the axis of heaviest rain be. Right now this kind of paints a three inch plus area across all of central Indiana. These would be the totals through 11 o'clock on the Saturday night. It may come in a couple different waves Thursday night into Friday morning and then Friday night into Saturday. Temperatures now with a generally nice sky 40 degrees in Tipton 44 in Bedford and Bloomington as I mentioned that west wind at about 15 miles per hour. Say hello to Riley. Riley, Riley oh, is a little mama. guy. Pause cross. Yeah he's a little guy. He's but posing. He, he commands the screen right now. Thanks to Kenny and Pam Lehman for sharing Riley with us. We'll take him for a walk this evening. Temperatures in the 30s with partly cloudy skies. A good evening to do that. You can send me your dog's picture, your cat. You have a horse. I've walked horses too. Kevin.Gregory at WRTV.com. Tomorrow, in the morning hours, lots of sunshine through the day. Uh, all weather systems kind of off to the east or staying to our west, and that means we wait a day with cooler temperatures getting to freezing north of Indianapolis. Indianapolis may hit 35 for the high, that west wind around 10. Temperatures a little warmer to the south. I guess the selling point tomorrow is the sunshine. Look at the wind on Thursday. That's transition day to much warmer air. Also introducing our chance for rain late in the day. Temperatures throughout the day will climb quickly. By the time we get to mid-afternoon, you're looking at temperatures around 50 degrees. I think the most likely time for the rain, though, will be after 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Here's your seven-day forecast becomes obvious here as we get to Friday and Saturday, the two wet days with the warmth, rain potentially heavy. Then we dry out as we cool off, 43 Sunday, chance of some rain again early next week. And notice, still no Arctic air, no storm systems around that we have to mention snow with. We could see some snow as the moisture is leaving Saturday night, but it's, it's mainly a rain. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember even last year seeing 50 in the forecast That's in January. That's crazy. Yeah. It happens. I guess so. As, yeah. as we can see. Thanks, Kevin, for that. Well, any mom with a baby has her hands full. Yeah, now try being the mom of twins, not once, but twice in the same year. That's the life a woman in West Palm Beach, Florida is living. She gave birth to two sets of twins in 2019. Mark and Malachi were born in March. Then in May, with no plans for more, she learned a second set was coming. On December 27th, Caitlin and Caleb joined the family. She recently learned both of her grandmother's lost twin boys at birth and now feels her babies are a blessing from above. I always say that I feel like my grandmothers gave me their kids because two sets of twins and their twins passed away. I feel like they just sent them down for me. Well, she also has a three-year-old daughter, and for now, she's hoping to keep her kid count to a party of five after winning what she calls the twin lottery. She needs more hands. Yeah, she does need more hands. Good <laughs> luck there, but they are beautiful kids. A wonderful family. How fun. Well, 20 years together, that's what country singing group Rascal Flats is celebrating this year. It's a milestone year for more reasons than one, and the celebration starts right here in Indiana. We'll be right back. Days from 4.30 to 7. Hello to you. I'm Julie Grant with Court TV, and we are covering two big trials for you today. Jury selection is underway in the Harvey Weinstein rape trial. The movie mogul is charged with five sex crimes against two different women. Many other women who claim Weinstein assaulted them are also expected to be at the courthouse carefully watching his trial. We'll have live updates for you from our New York studio. And we are also in Southern Ohio today for a heartbreaking trial. Parents Daniel and Jessica Groves are accused of murdering their infant son, Dylan. And in a stunning move during opening statements, we learned that Jessica Groves is taking responsibility for the crime. 
Her attorney promising the jury that Jessica will testify that she acted alone in murdering her infant son. Baby Dylan was found in the bottom of a well wrapped in plastic bags and weighted down. Drugs were also found in his system. And if his parents are convicted, they could spend the rest of their lives in prison. As always, you can count on Court TV for live gavel to gavel coverage of America's most compelling criminal trials. I'm Julie Grant, now back to you in the studio. Julie, thank you. And you can learn more about the other cases around the nation right now at CourtTV.com. One of their most famous songs is Life is a Highway. But that highway and life on the road will be coming to an end for the award-winning country group Rascal Flats. They announced today they are kicking off their farewell tour right here in central Indiana. Rascal Flats Farewell Life is a Highway Tour will begin June 11th at Ruoff Music Center in Noblesville. This year also marks the group's 20th anniversary and they say they are looking forward to spending it with their fans. Tickets will be available first as part of the Live Nation country mega ticket ticket information will be available in the coming weeks and we will keep you posted new at six tonight concerns growing over proposed changes at broad ripple park why some people are worried about building a new larger community center but first on the now indy it's billed as the greatest of all time the jeopardy competition pitting the three winningest players against each other we talked to them ahead of tonight's first game you're watching our tv six